Welcome to our last, but certainly not least interesting panel of this 2022 edition of Columbia Arbitration Day. We are very grateful uh, that you stick with us despite the quite late hour in the US and even more uh, in other parts of the world. Please do not hesitate to make use of the chat function in YouTube to ask your question to the panelists. I've heard that they were eager to answer all questions that you may have. Uh, before giving the floor to or have some moderator and panelist um, to address whether we should seek a different way to settle dispute between states and investors, and if yes, how we should do it, let me make two brief announcements. First, um, Columbia Arbitration Day participants can obtain up to six CLE credit. For those interested in CLE credits, this panel is accredited for 1.5 credits for arrears of professional practice. In order to obtain these credits, you'll need to fill the attendance form and the evaluation form, which are available to download on our website, and then send them to the email address addresses that are mentioned in the same uh, website. Please record all attendance verification code that will be displayed during the program on the bottom left corner. You will need them to fill the attendance form. All instructions regarding CLE credits are available on Columbia Arbitration Day website, and we have also uploaded reading materials related to the topic of this panel. In addition, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this year's CAD must unfortunately be held online. However, on the bright side of things, we've been able to waive the registration fee and to make Columbia Arbitration Day 2022 free of charges. That said, in light of the current situation in Ukraine and of the many conflicts that are still raging in other parts of the world, we would like to invite all participants to make a donation to a humanitarian organization of their choice. Without further ado, let me introduce our moderator, our very own Professor George Berman, a world-renowned authority on comparative law, as well as international litigation and arbitration and on U European Union law, which might come in, into, into the frame tonight, who is also a professor and director of the Center for International Commercial and Investment Arbitration at Columbia Law School. Professor Berman, the floor is yours. Simon, uh, thank you for that introduction and um, delighted to be here. Uh, I want to take a minute of privilege uh, uh, as a member of the faculty to express our, our great admiration for what the students have done this year. It's the 13th year. Um, and it, I know with the punishing classes that our students undergo, uh, that it's all the more an accomplishment to put on an event like this. The topic we have uh, is really in my in my understanding of it, uh, a question of architecture. Uh, what, what is the institutional framework uh, through which going forward, uh, we anticipate investor state disputes to be resolved? Uh, I made an assumption in organizing this panel that the decision-making would be along adjudicatory lines. Uh, and everything our panelists confront in this program will assume, I believe, a, a, an adjudicatory process. Um, but I want to say at the outset that perhaps with some imagination, um, there might be some non-adjudicatory means uh, that could be achieved. Uh, you know, we, we do think of mediation. That's not on the table for today. But I want to put our panel in perspective. Uh, so it's an architectural uh, panel. And each of our speakers uh, is going to address the question uh, of whether and what to extent institutional arrangement they're addressing uh, can have future utility uh, for us going forward. Uh, and I, what I want to do before I, I introduce the speakers and give you some idea of what they're going to uh, 
address, I would like to say at the outset uh, that we tend to assume um, that the solution lies in a treaty-based framework. Uh, and all of our panelists today, if I'm not mistaken, will be discussing architecture uh, that flows from a treaty. I thought it was worth pointing out that our other two types of arbitration, contract-based, statutory-based, probably not very promising. I think it's obvious with a contract-based, uh, we actually need a contract with a state or state instrumentality. And we don't have a state or a state instrumentality as a protagonist uh, in very many um, of our cases. Uh, with respect to statute-based, it is theoretically possible that every jurisdiction in the world would establish an investor protection statute providing for arbitration or some other means. Uh, but for obvious reasons, uh, that is uh, less than ideal, completely decentralized, unilateral by definition. It's legislative. So how we're going to proceed uh, is we're going to examine the structural uh, instruments with which we are most familiar, the ones that seem most likely to be with us over the long haul, uh, and try to examine what their strengths have been, uh, what their weaknesses have been, uh, and how they are situated, uh, how well they are situated uh, to equip us uh, for what's going forward. So we're going to start with our most familiar friend, um, which is bilateral investment treaties. And the question that uh, Clovis Trevino is going to address, uh, I believe, <laughs> is what do bits hold open to us going forward? How might they evolve uh, in ways that might make them more suitable. Uh, I've asked every uh, panelist to at least consider replying uh, to what the other panelists have had to say about the mechanism that they are discussing. Uh, now, just a word about Clovis. Clovis um, is uh, an attorney at Covington and Burling, where she handles a wide range of international commercial disputes. I've, I've come to know that she has a great background in public international law, which makes perfect sense. Um, I, somehow I heard, Clovis, that you, you might have a day in the International Court of Justice uh, coming up uh, fairly soon, but that's not our topic. Uh, Clovis is also an advisor to asset managers and has been dubbed one of Legal 500's rising stars. So, uh, Clovis, what, do bit, what have BITS done for us and what can we expect uh, them to be doing going forward? Thank you, George, and, and thank you everyone for joining. And I do have a court date on Monday, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I wanted to start just by thinking about where we are on BITs, but what is the purpose of the system, which is a foundational question. We're thinking of architecture and BITs are the foundation of that architecture. What is the goal? Is it economic development, protection of property rights, attracting investment in the traditional or regional intent? Or are we looking at broader goals such as sustainable development, human rights, climate change, protecting vulnerable populations, and the list goes on. So I think that the answer might be different depending on how you look at the goals of the investor state dispute settlement system, how they were established, how they are delineated, and how they are being just redefined as we speak. Do we preserve the status quo? Do we reform the system? 
or do we abandon the system altogether? So as many or all of you are aware, many countries have terminated or threatened to terminate bilateral investment treaties. And these countries include Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, uh, India, South Africa, and so on. And at the heart of this trend is the perception of a lack of symmetry and that somehow the system favors the interest of investors. Is this perception or is this reality? And does it matter? Where we stand now is in a moment of juncture and of change. I, I, see, I see reform, we have seen it, it's there, it's happening. And we're looking at two types of reform. We're looking at procedure and is it architecture? Is it structure? Is it the procedure that requires reform? Or are we also looking at substance? Is it the substantive law, the foundational law of that consent in instrument that needs to be revisited? If we look at procedure and substance, can we really delineate the two or are they intertwined? So let's perhaps focus on a couple of what I believe, perhaps I'm mistaken, are structural or procedural reforms that have been put on the table as a way forward to make the system perhaps more inclusive, more flexible, more capable of adapting to the demands of its users. So transparency, public participation. We have seen in recent BITs or model treaties express provisions stating that proceedings are permitted to be conducted on an open basis. Pleadings are to be made publicly available and tribunals have also been granted the power to allow non-party submissions. Is arbitration to remain confidential happening behind closed doors or should it be open to everyone? Who should have access? So I think this is a key question on the way forward. How are we defining who has a stake in investor state dispute settlement? And the survival of the system might be intertwined with the issue of access and transparency. Uh, another concern that of course is prevalent in the system is the cost and duration of BIT proceedings. Should the length of the proceedings, should the procedure itself be further regulated in these instruments to make it more accessible? We are all aware of, or, or we all have the, the idea that arbitration is efficient and faster than the courts, but that's not necessarily the case. So that has been a focus of criticism and that I think it is an important element of the way forward. How do we make the process more efficient, better, and, and more capable of resolving business disputes within the time frame that they need to be? Another mechanism or, or, or development that is perhaps not so, not so recent is that the treaty parties have asserted their control over the treaty and they want to promote a common interpretation. I'm thinking about NAFTA and the FTC notes on interpretation and the treaty parties simply asserting their interpretive powers. Let's look at some substantive issues that are also at the core of, of the debate or the, or the pressure or for reform. One of the issues is the state's right to regulate. This has been really coming into force in the third generation, second generation treaties. And for example, the Brazil Guyana BIT reaffirms the contracting parties' regulatory autonomy and policy space. We have also seen inclusions to health, safety, environment, sustainable development in many treaties. Are they directly actionable? We are not quite there yet, as far as I can tell. But following, for example, the tobacco cases, we have seen an increase in provisions that seek, for example, to exclude tobacco-related measures from the scope of application of a treaty. Other tools that have been adopted by treaty drafters 
include referencing in a treaty's preamble provisions serving the state's ability to exclude welfare measures from expropriation and general exception provisions. The Morocco-Japan BAT, for example, provides that its stated purpose is to seek to ensure that investment is consistent with the protection of health, safety, and the environment, the promotion and protection of internationally and domestically recognized human rights, labor rights, and internationally recognized standards of corporate social responsibility. Again, what is the goal of the investor state dispute settlement system? Is it limited to protecting, uh, promoting investment, protecting property rights, or are we looking at sustainable development, at protection of vulnerable populations? Is there room for human rights and corporate social responsibility within these instruments? I think this is a key question that states and users of the system will have to face if the system will move forward and survive in, in the future. Uh, we have also seen specific treaty provisions that are intended to define in more detail what the content of the substantive obligations are. For example, what does it mean to expropriate in the public interest? What is the content of the fair and equitable treatment standard? The EU-Vietnam Investment Protection Agreement provides, for example, that the parties reaffirm the right to regulate within their territories to achieve legitimate policy objectives, such as the protection of health, safety, environment, well, public morals, social, and consumer protection. This treaty, interestingly, also refers to the protection of cultural diversity. So what is the future of investment treaties? With new challenges and a profoundly different environment for international investment, social demands from treaties addressing international investments have changed. There is a new emphasis on ensuring that treaties generate not only development, but also sustainable development. And from my perspective, I think the future will demand such evolution into broader accountability, transparency, and involvement of stakeholders. And with that, I conclude my remarks and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Clovis. Uh, as you can imagine, I have one for you. Uh, what you have described by way of challenges are challenges that are probably going to arise uh, in virtually any architecture that we might create. I don't know to what extent you think they are peculiar uh, to bilateral investment treaties, uh, but more generally, uh, is an adequate is it adequate to build a world system of investor protection on bits? So I'm, I'm actually putting aside the question of the content of the bit and the interests that are being, um, you know, protected or advanced. Uh, but right now we are very largely bit based yeah. and large numbers of bits. Uh, is that how we should go forward um, institutionally? Do you have thoughts about that? Should we be thinking about a multilateral framework? Should we be revisiting the architecture more broadly? We need to think about it. That's a that's a very good question. But what what do we have? We have a network of BITs, and and the the change might be slow and incremental, but it, it's also happening at the bilateral level. So to the extent that we can look at change from what we have, which is the BIT. I think that that's the starting point. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, our other speakers are going to address some of those alternatives. Uh, do any of my panelists want to raise a question or a comment uh, 
on the basis of what Clovis said. Andrea, good to see your hand. Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I was wanting to pick up a little bit on what you said about transparency and the importance of it going forward. And, and I wondered if you had ideas about why many states have been so reluctant to embrace transparency. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Patrick and, uh, and I will tell you that, you know, the United States and Julie do that the United States and Canada have been transparent since 2001, you know, for so for 20 years, we've had extensive kind of transparency here. And we've had the Mauritius Convention open for signature now since 2014, which would uh, impose uh, transparency based rules in treaty arbitration to uh, on existing investment treaties, yet states have been very slow to take that up. And I wondered if you had ideas about um, why that might be the case and what might change that going forward. My sense is that what's going to change going forward is access to information as a human right and the idea that citizens have access and should be able to take part of a process that has an impact in their lives. And my sense is that the reluctance to allow for that level of transparency is inherited, it's historical, but it also has to do with how difficult and contentious these cases can become and how difficult it can be to settle a case or resolve a dispute if you open it up to the public. So uh, I'm only speculating, but that, that's, my, that's my big picture sense. Thank I'm, you. I'm afraid in the interest of time, we're, we're gonna to have to move to a, a, another approach. Now, I um, before we do that, since everyone's intervening, let me take a minute to introduce the entire panel rather than wait for each panelist uh, turn. Uh, so let me very quickly introduce um, our next speaker who will speak shortly, Julie Bedar, who is uh, the head of Skadden Arps uh, arbitration and litigation group for the Americas. Uh, Julie comes from uh, a tradition and a course of study that has equipped her uh, with a profound knowledge of both civil and common law systems. Uh, she is multilingual in the extreme uh, and she is a member of the panel of the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, I can't, of course, resist saying Julie was my doctoral student uh, some time ago, and we don't get too many in our field. So it was a real privilege. Uh, I asked Julie, um, well, let me, let me first move on to um, Andrea, who has just spoken. Andrea is the Eve Fortier Professor of International Arbitration at McGill University. Uh, she was the first scholar in residence um, at ICSID. And I can tell you from personal experience, she's played a major leadership role in the ASIL, in the ITA, and alongside of her, uh, I've witnessed her leadership in the Uncitral Working Group um, Academic Forum. Uh, I'll simply add that I first met uh, Andrea uh, when she was at the State Department, lo those many years ago, uh, when I had the good fortune to be um, an expert witness in a case that Andrea was handling. Uh, so we're going to hear from Andrea shortly. Um, I'm going to finally introduce Patrick Pearsall, um, who is um, uh, the engine, I think, these days of, uh, of the Allen and Overy international arbitration practice. Um, I think Patrick will always be viewed as the consummate insider uh, in all of this. Uh, largely due to the years he spent as chief of investment arbitration team at the Department of State. So he's looked at this from many, many angles. Uh, he is an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center. Uh, I noticed that he was described as having a razor sharp mind. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna get to see that in operation, 
Um, but I will simply add finally that um, Patrick displayed that in the classroom and I will leave that there. Uh, so everybody having been introduced, <laughs> Julie, I asked Julie to do something a little unusual, which was to bear down on free trade agreements uh, as a unit of a worldwide system of investment protection. Uh, after BITS, which we've just covered, uh, investment chapters of free trade agreements um, are what we're seeing, um, and they are developing as we as we speak. Uh, so I asked Julie to think a little bit about well, what are their what are their salient features? Uh, what have they done for us? What do they hold out, and what limitations? Uh, and I think Julie, you're probably going to go down that road. Indeed, with Thank many you. thanks. Um, it's um, always a pleasure to participate in Columbia events, which has a very special place in, mm -hmm. in my heart and in my life. Um, so we've, I think, aptly defined as Professor Berman likes to do to give us themes that we can really build on to have a reflection uh, that we nourish with various aspects of our analysis. And he's mentioned, he's really got us started with architecture. Um, and I think when you think of someone like uh, like Patrick, then you know he's probably an architect of that system alongside the many uh, members of the various trade departments which have negotiated in recent years various instruments. And Professor Berman has asked me to focus on the trade agreements specifically. Um, and because there's really a trend there in terms of what, uh, governments have been doing. If you look back at 1990, we had approximately 50 regional trade agreements. Um, and, you know, ma many of these do contain investment chapters, but there's really um, a, an increase of, of, that, uh, of, that, of that trend because as of February, we're really counting 352 regional uh, trade agreements. So you can see the jump from 50 to 352. That's an unmistakable change in the architecture that Professor Berman is asking us to consider. Um, the, and this includes this global trend of uh, trade agreements with investment chapters definitely, most definitely includes um, the United States. The U.S. currently has some 14 free trade agreements with 20 countries, most of which do include um, investment chapters. Um, and I, I think without, I don't think we are going to dwell too much on you know, the differences between uh, the trade agreements with investment chapters and the BITs, but let me just make one point, which is because the investment chapters are part of a greater whole, namely the trade agreement, they are negotiated as such. Um, and the dynamics as a result, of course, are much more perhaps uh, multifold in their different facets, which also brings to bear what Clovis was inviting us to consider in terms of the various uh, competing goals, concerns, considerations, constituents, and so on that may be taken into account in the process of treaty negotiation. Uh, what I uh, would suggest that, that we do in the limited time that, that we have is perhaps look at some examples and then uh, take uh, take a little bit of a, a big picture um, backseat type type look. Um, in terms of examples, um, this conference, of course, would not be uh, complete or this panel would not be complete if, if we didn't speak about the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, trade agreement, the USMCA, which entered into force on July 1st, 2020, which replaced uh, NAFTA, which had been in effect since 1994. Um, the, the USMCA has a very new regime when it comes to uh, investment protection, um, in some respects rolling back some of the investor protections, but also defining other aspects of investment protection in a way that they haven't uh, been before. Uh, in terms of substantive uh, protection, the investment chapter of the USMCA uh, 
does provide um, all of the substantive protection typical of the investor state uh, jurisprudence that we, that we are familiar with, whether it's most favored nation, national treatment, um, expropriation, and minimum standard uh, of treatment. Um, there is even some areas where uh, arguably there's a, uh, an expansion. If you think of Article 1410, that does place restrictions on the party's abilities to, buy, to tie treatment of investments to certain performance requirements. Um, so that's certainly spelling things out to a degree that we may not have seen uh, before in the investment protection arena. Uh, the, the substantive protections um, often track the language of uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, which uh, has been abandoned, to which the US, Mexico, and, and Canada were, were party to. Um, and the, the vast majority of changes uh, relative to substantive protections were designed to insert what I guess some, you know, many would say or uh, call interpretative glosses or gloss that the, the United States has uh, argued um, in, in various cases over the years with respect to the intended meeting of some of the NAFTA provisions or the provisions of the other BITs and FTA investment chapters. Um, therefore, some are talking about a codification of uh, some of the NAFTA uh, jurisprudence or the arguments that were made. For example, perhaps the, uh, the definition of uh, the investment and the, the Cellini test. Um, I think we won't, we don't have time to debate um, the nature of these changes in details and reasonable people disagree about whether uh, they, they help uh, or, or not or hurt uh, investors. However, it's, it's unmistakable that in taking a, a, a view or having a certain perspective on what, what is from an arch architectural viewpoint, the change that we are seeing, um, it, it is really that we're seeing very significant blocks uh, created or removed under the new system. Canada is exempted completely from ISDS under the USMCA. Um, and as a result, only investors from Mexico and the United States have the ability to, to bring claims against those two countries. And this, of course, you know, when a, a country, when you do things like that, you remove one, one country. This is, this is new in terms of the architecture of how the treaties are, are built. You no longer have uh, everything being in a mirror fashion or everything being equal if you can start having these carve outs and these differing treatment type situations depending on the identity of the country and also uh, what, what we are seeing in other respects with certain concepts and categories of investors being created uh, with some having some rights and others having different sets of rights under the same instrument. So uh, I think Professor Berman couldn't have, you know, used a better term than architecture, because literally, if you think of this as a as a building or as a structure, we're building things very differently, and there's a lot of push and pull, um, and we're still, I think, in a in a phase where, given all of the um, the reflection and and some of the uh, misgivings that were identified in various places, we various governments are negotiating and uh, trying to express and find new ways of building the system in a way that they might uh, recognize better. And it's important also to always remember that when governments do this, uh, we talk a lot about the double hatting of, of arbitrators, but governments do have uh, very much this double identity when they have those negotiations because they're at the same time, of course, thinking about uh, the claims that could be brought against um, their own government, but they're also protecting their investors. And it's that, that push and pull, uh, which is now, I think, giving rise to a lot of these um, experiments in, in, some of, in some of the treaties. Um, I, I see that um, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, if, if we're going to just say one last thing about the, the USMCA, the, the concept of um, covered investors versus general investors is what I was referring to in terms of different investors having um, different rights. General investors 
have very significantly limited ISDS protections, whereas the, the covered investors have much more robust protections. Um, a word about the uh, comprehensive and progressive agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, because I, I think it's important to, to mention this as a potential example. We can't talk about all of the 352 that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so we'll, we're just being very selective here about the instruments that we are discussing. Um, and it will indeed be very interesting as Professor Bremen suggested for the other panelists to, to comment, particularly given the uh, real life experience of uh, Patrick and Andreas with, with the treaties in, the, in, in their prior life um, with, the, with the, the government. The, the CPTPP, um, the, the relatively limited investor protections in the USMCA stand in contrast to the protections provided in uh, the CPTPP. And in January 2017, you may recall that the Trump administration withdrew from TPP in favor, favor of renegotiating uh, NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. And the remaining 11 parties to TPP, which do include both Canada and Mexico, nonetheless proceeded with the agreement um, and signed CPTPP on March 8, 2018. CPTPP largely um, retains the same text as the original TPP, but with uh, certain limited provisions that were suspended. Um, and these suspended provisions are mostly the provisions that had been included um, at the request of, of the United States. And you will recognize things like investment agreement being defined, investment authorization. Um, and those are the type of provisions which have been, uh, which have been suspended. Um, the suspended, um, maybe what, what would be important to, uh, to mention, because I, I think there is some uncertainty about what might happen in the future with respect to the overall interpretation of, of the treaty, should there ever be a return and should we ever reconsider what happens with the unsuspension of the suspended provision and how they might interact with the rest of the treaty. But the, the, the CPTPP um, uh, otherwise largely you know, tracks the USMCA in, this, in its substantive protections um, and does not limit ISDS. In terms of substantive uh, protections, much of the substantive language in the CPTPP is the same as in the USMCA. Like in the USMCA, CPTPP contains protection for national treatment, most favored nation, um, direct and indirect expropriation, and minimum standard of treatment. Uh, however, relative to the CPTPP, the USMCA has far, uh, far more um, clarifications, the four greater certainty uh, type clauses that do set out the traditional positions of the US government. Um, in terms of procedural protections, I had mentioned before that the USMCA uh, really distinguishes itself with the new categories of investors being uh, created, general versus covered. The CPTPP does not have this tiered uh, system of four ISDS. And as a result, the investors can bring claims for the breach of the substantive provisions of the investment chapter. Um, so you really have largely the same sub substantive obligations uh, under these instruments, but they differ greatly in terms of this procedural aspects and the definition of, of the investors. Um, the US investors investing in, in Canada um, and Mexico will not have the same ISDS protection that Canadian and Mexican investors have vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. And that uh, other CPTPP nations have in Mexico and, and in Canada. Um, I, you know, I think we, we may be able to leave some time for discussion with respect to the, the position of, of Canada under these these two instruments, um, given that it's it's markedly different, some of this has to do with the timing of the negotiation of, of the treaties, and we can chat about that if there's time in in, um, in the debate portion of this panel. The last thing I would leave you uh, with, and, and Professor Berman, let me know if I should really uh, cut this mm -hmm. short, is the EU UK Trade um, and Cooperation Agreement. Um, this uh, this instrument is is really quite stunning in how 
few investor protections um, it includes. Um, you do have national treatment and most favored nation protections, but you do not see uh, explicit protections against expropriations, direct or indirect, nor do you have uh, minimum standard of treatment protections, um, such as you know, fair and equitable treatment or full protection and security protections. So it, there's really no ISDS at all <laughs> under the EU UK um, TCA to use the to use the acronym. You were you are reverting in terms of architecture to the architecture we had prior to bits, uh, where uh, the claims of investors and their concerns were ultimately addressed only through state to state uh, negotiations and communications. There is really only state to state dispute settlement similar to the WTO uh, framework, which leaves the, the investors with really no direct uh, recourse as such. Um, you will uh, probably have learned with Professor Berman and, and others about other instruments that are not regional or geographic in nature, like the Energy Charter Treaty. That has been around for, for some time. But if we look, really look at the future and we think about our 300 or so uh, 50 regional trade agreements uh, that are in force. And if you look at where where the, the users are, so to speak, the states are located, clearly Europe stands out with 154 of those. Uh, East Asia at about 100, South America at approximately 70. North America and Africa are lagging behind in those numbers with uh, 50 and 47 regional trade agreements, uh, respectively. And the biggest, quote unquote, users of regional trade agreements uh, by, if you look at the data by individual country, we're talking about the EU and the United Kingdom. Mexico, Korea, and Japan are also in the top 10 countries uh, by number of regional trade agreements that they entered into. The United States is not, is not in the top 10. Um, in terms of what's in the pipeline, we have 17 regional trade agreements not notified to the WTO in the first six months of 2021. Um, so even you know just during the, the pandemic. Um, and the world's largest trade deal has uh, recently come into force at the beginning of this year. And that one is called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which covers 15 countries you know, astoundingly 30% approximately of the world's population and its total uh, economic output. The U.S. is not a party to this arrangement, but China, uh, China is. So let me just leave you with um, this thought of whether these larger trade agreements um, will remain static, will, will grow, will shrink again. But clearly there's an unmistakable trend of integrating the investment uh, negotiation and the design of investment protection to integrate them with the design and the architecture of trade protections. And, and these instruments are negotiated as such, um, as a whole, um, with all of the considerations that, that you can possibly think of really being negotiated uh, together and considered at the same time. And that there isn't, you know, really isn't uniformity if you've uh, seen from the description that I just gave, there, there are different solutions that governments are putting forward. Um, and I think the it will be very interesting to see uh, the evolution and, of course, the, the claims that will be brought under all of the this wealth of new instruments that were uh, negotiated in recent years. Many thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Julie. We, I, I think we have a little bit of time for a few questions or comments from my colleagues, but let me, as usual, jump in and ask you something, Julie. Uh, what's distinctive, or among the things that are distinctive about these agreements is that, as you said, investment chapters are just an investment chapter. And therefore, uh, they're placed in a more political context than uh, a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, and, uh, you know, Patrick is probably the one who's going to be able to tell us most about this. So don't feel pressure, Julie. Uh, but I'm wondering what, in terms of outcomes, is the difference between negotiating a bit and negotiating an investment chapter of 
a free trade agreement? Uh, I think that's, but that's an important set of questions uh, that may influence the extent to which we enthusiastically go forward with free trade agreements. At its worst, I don't know if this happens, you could say investor protection is held hostage uh, by the fortunes or misfortunes of the trade agreement. Uh, that remains to be seen. But the last thing I want to mention, Julie, and here I would like to hear what you have to say, uh, there's something very architecturally uh, unsatisfactory about this plethora of free trade agreements. Um, you have 352. Um, how are they? It seems like a recipe for chaos. Is it not the case that two countries, you know, involved in a dispute uh, are signatories of more than one a free trade agreement? Now, the, I'm sure there are solutions to those problems, but architecturally, it confuses me. <laughs> a little bit compared to 3,000 bits on the one hand or a multilateral court um, on the other hand. Um, am, I, am I being unduly troubled by the disorder uh, among these? I think it probably depends how you look at it. Um, and I agree with you that it will be important to get the perspective of uh, you know, Patrick and, and Andrea on this. And Patrick, I know that perhaps you, your connection lapsed for a moment and we, we, uh, we associated you closely with the architecture and described you as one of the architects of, of, the, of, of the system, you and, and many colleagues, of course. But I, I, I think if you, and I know this is as, as someone who teaches um, at, at Columbia, the, the various ways in which claims can be brought um, uh, under, you know, many, many uh, institutions and, and the auspices of many institutions and, and laws and so on. And, and I know one would be as an academic very concerned about whether the system is built in a cohesive way. And, and certainly the civilian mind uh, that in me is always looking for a cohesiveness in, in a legal system. Um, and I, I think, uh, without being unfair, uh, one might associate the building of the multi, uh, well, the, the juxtaposition of the bits together with the, the various trade agreements that we have as perhaps a little bit more of a common law growth of the, uh, of the system than, than what civilian minds might have uh, created, I suppose. But um, there are different choices made by governments at different points in time. And, and these agreements, when they are different, are often uh, resulting, or they, they are often the result of having been signed at different times by you know, different, different people, different governments. And, and yet the state, of course, continues. Uh, the state is the same, uh, but the people who negotiate these instruments or make the decision about them because there's obviously a lot of stability uh, a lot of times inside the various departments involved. But I think the political decisions uh, can vary significantly as we have seen with entire treaties being negotiated and, and ultimately a decision may be made in the next government to, to pull out from it. Um, so let me, uh, I would like my colleagues to, to address this. This may not necessarily be for if you're looking for positive or negatives, I'm not sure that we necessarily have to jump to the conclusion that this is a negative, because I think if the if the states and the investors ultimately are um, looking to try new ways of resolving the controversies, we're certainly in a, in a period where many new different uh, strategies are being implemented in these treaties. Julia, uh, I, I want to turn to my colleagues, but... Um, if I'm correct, that any given dispute might be raised under more than one free trade agreement, depending mm -hmm. on, upon the population of states that are within them, one might say, well, this, this will give investors more choice. Um, it seems to me, but Patrick will tell me if I'm right or wrong, 
that there will be an element of choice uh, for an investor if the two states are members of more than one free trade agreement. Uh, and that must be the case. But le let me ask my colleagues to, to weigh in on the very interesting issues that Julie has raised. Patrick. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, I'll take the bait. Uh, I mean, Julie has presented us with a very comprehensive view on, on, on the, 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 in some ways, the pluses and minuses of, of regionalism. I, I would say, uh, George, that we should be careful in assuming that non-cohesiveness is necessarily an evil in this space. I think that that trade and investment policy um, is needs to be bespoke in a, in a certain way. Now that cuts, of course, across a, a certain kind of multilateralism, a certain kind of regionalism, and unfortunately, it runs up against the durability of some of these instruments, which are um, not by definition flexible, right? Because they are multilateral treaties or regionally multilateral treaties that that require consent of all parties for amendment and withdrawal and, and things like that. So in some ways, regionalism allows for a certain kind of flexibility on a multilateral scale that is by definition cohesive, more cohesive than perhaps bilateralization, but it the, the fact that there are overlapping and competing uh, forces in the multilateral in the regional space is is to be expected and perhaps even celebrated, right? Because the the trade relationship with the United States and Canada, for example, is the most robust and cohesive trade relationship outside of the EU. Um, and uh, what should and shouldn't qualify investors in that space is is far different than perhaps the relationship that the United States would have wanted with Vietnam or another party to the TPP. Right. So so there is in some ways not a one size fits all. And and in fact, we wouldn't perhaps want a one size fit all situation here. I, I would also just add and I'll stop because I don't know how responsive I'm actually being is that the, the state, you know, Julie has pointed out the two roles of the state. Right. One as defender of its own regulatory interests and another as a protector of its investors abroad. I, I would posit that the state also has a third role in, in a kind of trinity, and that is as lawgiver. And one of the thing, uh, you know, the treaty making process is actually a state process, right? And in that role, the state has an obligation to its other states, to its treaty partners, but it also has an obligation to the system. And I think that, that most states, when approaching even a bilateral investment agreement or a, bi or a, or a smaller regional trade agreement, is thinking about the systemic issues created, right? So you'll look at the TPP, for example, the United States and other parties put into the TPP something like 40, 50 times using the words for greater certainty, which is meant to look back and retroactively harmonize across multiple regions what those obligations mean. So the state also is acting as lawgiver. So I would, I would also say that even though there are sometimes overlapping and competing um, interests or obligations for the investor, these the USMCA and TPP for Canadian and Mexican investors, that both Canada and Mexico are still trying to harmonize um, across those regions. So let me stop there. I, as Julie was speaking, I was struck by the fact that in Unsuccessful Working Group 3, um, the, the discussion is constantly, um, shall it be status quo, which means bits, uh, or shall it be a multilateral institution? But one, what one could contemplate is a system based on free trade agreements. And I gather you would think that was not undesirable, that all we would have would be multinational free trade agreements. Is that right, Patrick? Is that a is that a system that we can we can work with? I mean, we'll work with whatever system is <laughs> is in place. Um, it's it, it's no longer my question, um, but I you know I think that uh, 
the the key is if we believe and this is a this is a if we believe question if we still believe that foreign direct investment protecting foreign direct investment will promote it then i do think that there is there is benefit to to this system right and however that system finds its its footing to protect investment is a good thing um but the structure the architecture is 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 different but that's the mooring post whether we actually believe protecting investment promotes it well thanks patrick um you know julie i'm sure you have something to say about all of this but then again you're our next speaker so uh maybe you will you can fold your questions or observations on what has been said about free trade agreement based uh, investor protection in your discussion of uh, multilateral uh, institutions. So, so Julie will, will take us um, through, I guess, um, there's more than one model, multilateral model. One could even say the Energy Charter Treaty uh, is an example, it happens to be sectoral, uh, but anyway, Andrea, it would be very interesting to find out what you think are the, the subspecies, uh, if they exist, of multilateral uh, architecture. Uh, well, uh, thank you, thank you, George. Um, I didn't, you know, I don't have slides, but I can't, given the architectural discussions that we've been having, I can't resist showing, you know, this picture of uh, the Uncitral's um, you know, kind of model of what reform might uh, look like uh, in the multilateral space. Uh, one, one thing just to to comment on, which should be kind of evident, but I think sometimes gets lost when we talk about reform, is that even if we have reform, let's assume there's some kind of multilateral instrument, other things are not going away immediately. Nobody is going to be able to wave a magic wand or snap their fingers and end the Energy Charter Treaty and end the USMCA and end the RCEP and end the CPTPP and end the 2800 investment or thereabouts investment treaties. So whatever happens either at, at UNCITRAL or regionally or you know, with reform potentially of the Energy Charter Treaty, um, I think those things are all going to be operating in parallel and they're gonna be operating in parallel for quite some time. Uh, so that's one thing to, you know, we're going to have a very complicated uh, architectural front because I, you know, we're not, we're not going to get everybody into this nice little house um, overnight. It'll be a long moving process, assuming, uh, assuming it ever happens. Um, but George, I, I am going to talk mostly about the potential for a multilateral investment court, um, but with some of the kind of amendments or additions that are being discussed at working group three now. Uh, so the basic architecture calls for a two tiered system with a, um, if we start at the beginning with the kind of, I think, idea of the European Commission, you have a first instance court uh, with an appellate body on the top. Uh, however, in the course of uh, discussions at Uncitral Working Group Three, there have been uh, there's uh, been an embrace of what is called open architecture, uh, meaning that there would be a plethora of options from which states could choose, and that is true at each level. So, if you look at the first instance level, there could be state to state arbitration. There could be uh, invest kind of normal uh, traditional investment arbitration. There could be a first instance investment court, and there could even be a first foray into domestic courts. Um, and the idea is that states could pick and choose among those. And then you could look at up at, up at the, the upper level, the appellate level, you might be able to have an appeal from the state to state mechanism, from the traditional ISDS, from the the first instance court, um, or even from uh, even from domestic courts, um, so that's the so this is the kind of open architecture model. And I should say at the sides, you actually also have alternative dispute resolution. I know we're not talking about mediation, George, but that's you know been proposed as an addition, maybe as a you know mandatory mediation or 
or alternative dispute resolution. Um, so the, uh, the, the structure tends to be complicated. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, you have potentially more options, which means you have more choices that states will have to make. Uh, the clear, I'd say, genesis of this is the notion that you have a better opportunity to get consensus, right? If you have more options, you don't have to convince uh, China um, that it has to adopt a multilateral investment court. But if it's willing to adopt an appellate body, maybe that is a, a good thing. Um, I mean, in terms of getting some kind of agreement on some kind of reform. But I think there's a great deal more complexity and um, a great deal more, uh, you know, potential for um, maybe success in getting a multilateral body and architecture, but maybe an architecture that doesn't do what it's meant to do. So in, in other words, will achieving consensus mean offering so many options that the underlying goals will be frustrated uh, so, so that we have... Um, uh, I mean, success in a bigger sense, but perhaps not success in a in a more uh, simple sense. Um, we also have, and I, I think uh, in a little bit or a few times, I will pick up on a few things that that Clovis mentioned as salient in reform of investment treaties, because of course we're seeing some of those same things in in the UNSA trial process and the multilateral process. Um, which, as as she mentioned, as you mentioned, George, too, ha is limited to procedure, at least for now, although we still have some, I think, problems net distinguishing between substance and procedure. Uh, for example, the proposal is that this new mechanism would permit counterclaims, yet I would suggest that counterclaims are inextricably linked with applicable law. So if you're going to have counterclaims, then you're going to have to try to figure out what the counterclaims are going to be about. State environmental law, state uh, state labor laws, uh, international human rights law, assuming we think uh, investors have obligations, uh, etc., and that would seem to me to be more of a substantive issue. There's a proposal to prohibit shareholders' claims for reflective loss. Again, I think that could arguably be regarded as substantive rather than procedural. Um, um, and also the imposition of denial of benefits provisions. Again, arguably substantive rather than procedural. Uh, but but setting setting that aside, I uh, just noted uh, that I think those those things are at uh, in in the multilateral sphere too, because there is you know some concern that the reforms don't go far enough, and that maybe you cannot achieve the goals that many who are concerned about the legitimacy of investor state arbitration want to achieve without focusing on substance in addition to procedure. Um, but given that we're looking at procedure, um, I, I wanted to highlight just a few of the the areas where I think the the reforms and the the open architecture that trying to satisfy kind of all kinds of potential constituencies might have a negative effect on the goals that UNSA Trial Working Group Three were at least initially trying to achieve. Um, I think uh, Julie mentioned this already, um, duration and costs, you know, there are concerns about how long cases take and uh, how much they cost. But, you know, to point out the fact that if you add a mandatory mediation phase, if you have frivolous claims, which we already do in ICSID anyway, um, if you, you have no way, I think, in the multilateral uh, procedural rules to solve resolve the concerns uh, about what the you know definition of investor definition of investment. So you're still going to have jurisdictional issues, and if you add a denial of benefits uh, provision to the treaty, you're going to have co you know jurisdictional objections raised on denial of benefits grounds. You still have a merits phase. You still have a quantum phase. You'll have an appeal in almost every case. And this architectural structure doesn't deal with enforcement about where or how an enforcement procedure is going to be, all of which is to suggest that the more 
of these procedural bells and whistles you add, the more likely it is that you're going to have a longer procedure and possibly a more expensive procedure because even if you save on, you know, arbitrator's fees, um, the biggest uh, piece of the expenses in an arbitration are attorney's fees, and you're going to have a lot of attorney's fees for all of these different stages. Um, we know that a second, a second goal is achieving consistency, coherence, predictability, and that's the kind of goal of having an appellate procedure. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting to think about how this is meant to work if you have um, the possibility of having a state to state body and you have an appeal from or a state to state first instance procedure and you have an appeal from that, is that a different chamber? Like in other words, do you have one appeals body with that sits in different chambers or do you have different appeals bodies for these different uh, avenues that lead up to them? Um, how do those decisions, if there are chambers or if they're separate, how do those decisions relate to each other. If you have a state-to-state -state dispute in a, you know, in a in the Morocco-Japan bit, this is you know being imaginative there, uh, and it, but it decides something that's also in the U.S.-Colombia bit. Does that decision have anything to do with the U.S.-Colombia bit? Um, and let's assume, for the sake of argument, that the U.S. is not part of this mechanism, and probably Colombia either. Um, uh, so how, how is that all, and how does that state, and if it's a state to state procedure, deciding whether the minimum standard of treatment is limited, uh, in a certain way, what effect does that have on the investor state mechanism? Is it the, the treat, does the state to state tribunal, uh, appellate body trump the investor state appellate body, or, or is there going to be some mechanism to make sure that they, uh, never have a a disparate uh, decision. Um, so I think those are, um, I, I think there are also potentially going to be issues in terms of trying to harmonize procedure if your first instance tribunal is an investment arbitration and uh, the body hears appeals from that process, um, but also hears appeals from the from the a MIC from a first instance court where you have different evidentiary rules and that can't really be harmonized. And what effect does that have on uh, harmonization? Um, third, you know, issue that is really uh, kind of hot right now, but really uh, difficult and complex is the selection and appointment of adjudicators. How many will there be? Um, at which level, at each, how many will there be? How many will there be at each level? How do you satisfy, this is just a difficult question, how you satisfy what are really multiplicitous goals, regional diversity, gender diversity, experience diversity, both in terms of, for, you know, maybe public international law experience, civil and common law experience, industry experience, uh, government experience, um, uh, cognitive diversity. Um, what about local knowledge and representational issues? What about developed country experience versus, you know, non-developed country experience? Um, in one sense, the more people you have, the easier this might be, right? Because you have more people, you can find more people to kind of fit all of these various criteria. Uh, but, um, uh, but, 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 uh, it, it's you know the, the, it's a challenge as we see in general investment arbitration when you at least theoretically can have different people in all of the different areas. Um, it's even more of a challenge in when you're limiting the number of people that you have, and then also think about how that selection process is going to work um, in part over time, right? So, so if people are if states are going to sign on incrementally. And the 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 a body has already been set. Will you be able to get a state to sign on? What I'm trying, you know, so we've got our let's say seven appellate body members, and then Columbia wants to sign on, but says I had nothing to do with any of those appellate body members. I don't like those appellate body members. I want we I want to say in who's going to be on the appellate body um, if I'm going to sign on. So how will those those considerations be uh, be resolved? Um, uh, uh, 
how do we and and if you know uh, you know if you are having this open architecture um what is it that we're going to do on this let's say upper level of the appellate body are there different chambers and the different states that are signed on to those different chambers do they pick different arbitrators for each body i'm sorry adjudicators or are they all part of the same overall structure and again how do you manage uh to coordinate that um i was thinking you know a, a little bit i know i know uh, patrick is in charge of being imaginative so i don't want to in any way uh in, infringe on his uh prerogative but it, it was occurred to me as I looked at this, can investors and states bring cases together? I mean, or do we still, do we go back to potential, not quite diplomatic protection, but cooperation? You know, Clovis mentioned who are going to be the, who could be the claimants, who are going to be the users. Is it, is it NGOs? Is it affected communities? Is it the states? Um, as in local parentis for these other, you know, for these other uh, individuals, um, could could you expand more broadly who would would bring a case? Um, you know, can states bring cases claims against investors? Um, uh, uh, is another kind of another issue, um, and. It, so I, I guess in, in the light of the time, I'll go ahead and, and, and kind of stop there. But just to suggest that the uh, I think there is a, a lot of kind of excitement about and uh, obviously a lot of attention being given to creating a multilateral uh, a multilateral body. But I do have I guess some concerns that the more uh, creativity comes in to try to imagine all kinds of different things that if you wind up with a body that tries to be all things to all people, it will either never come to fruition or come to fruition in a way that cannot resolve some of the concerns that uh, led to its being created in the first place. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, it would be interesting, uh, we're gonna turn to Patrick momentarily, but it would be interesting to have a discussion, you to have a discussion, Andrea, with the, with the European Commission uh, about this, because the European Commission has presented this model as in some way a consolidation, uh, in some way streamlined, and what seems to be developing possibly is the antithesis of, of that. Uh, so I think that's a dialogue, a discussion that lies ahead. Um, I don't think the initial proponents of this idea in the least had in mind what you're telling us is emerging. Um, well, Patrick, um, we're nearing, we have just enough time, I think, um, to um, subject ourselves to, to how you're going to challenge us or provoke us. Uh, but Patrick's uh, mandate was to step back, listen to his co-panelists, uh, and me, of course, and tell us what it all adds up to. Patrick? Well, thank you. And I, I, I'm giving you a, a, a warning that I probably will almost certainly fail in my mandate because I've, I've, I've thought a little bit about kind of what future means in this space. And I, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I was left with more questions than answers. But I, I want to first thank the Columbia Arbitration Day and the students. You do such an incredible job. Um, and as George mentioned, I was asked to speak on, on the future, um, the future of investment protection, the future of international investment law, the future of dispute resolution. I want to focus the 10 minutes that I have on the actual architect, not the architecture, but the architect. And you've already heard a lot about the future today. Clovis has given us a view on the potential future of BITs um, on the eve of, of what it was going to be a, an historic uh, court event, and we all wish her luck. Uh, Julie has deconstructed a web of regional trade agreements, um, differing obligations under the USMCA and the, the TPP, um, and how those may operate in the years to come. And Andrea has definitely spoken about the, the house of multilateralism that is potentially being created. Um, so, so what are the most salient architectures that we are likely to see in the future that we have all been talking about? And I, I wish I had an answer 
Um, I could tell you that investment protection and the various international investment agreements will persist and provide individuals with what has become the strongest tool that they have against state conduct ever created within the international law system. I could tell you that the styles of this architecture will likely diverge along geoeconomic centers of gravity, perhaps with China and the United States as pillars. I could tell you that investment protection will more likely depend on the quality and political nature of the investment in, years, in the coming years. Who is investing? Why are they investing? Where are they investing? A direct challenge to the free market principles perhaps underlying the Washington consensus. I could tell you about the various positions that states have at the UNCTRAL Working Group 3 reform process, and I could tell you that trade will likely depend more on the local individual, what I've called the retail versus the wholesale trade policy. And I could tell you that regionalism is supplanting globalism and that bilateral relationships will likely take priority over multilateralism. And I could tell you all of this within the context of the state, and I could tell you all of these things, but I don't think any of us know what tomorrow will bring. And that may sound like a truism, and of course it is. But that truism was always informed by a reference to some ordered reality. Rational people will say the sun will rise tomorrow. To say that none of us know what tomorrow will bring is necessarily overdetermined. We do know more or less. But we are living through a significant inflection point. To build a building, any architect will tell you, you need to understand the foundation. And right now, the ground of international law is shaking. We are struggling to gain our balance and the international order, the order continues to rumble beneath us. So what does investment protection mean in a world where economic sanctions are the primary non-kinetic tool of restraining illegal actions by a state? What does investment protection mean in that environment? What does it mean to protect investment in that context? How do we today calibrate orthodox customary international law conceptions of the minimum standard of treatment and expropriation when economies and economics are more political than ever? And I'm reminded of an article written by one of Columbia's greatest professors, Professor Oscar Schachter. And Professor Schachter wrote an article in 1977 where he posited famously that there is, quote, an invisible college of international lawyers, end quote. This college of lawyers are charged with and responsible for the maintenance of international law, peace, human rights, liberty, the hidden architects. Watchers on the wall, protecting the global legal order, unbound by national allegiance, fidelity first and foremost to propping up and stitching together a system of law on which our lives and our freedom depend. And the peaceful settlement of disputes is a foundational principle of this global order that the invisible college of lawyers is charged with protecting. International arbitration, including international investment arbitration, is one tool in the international lawyer's toolkit to keep us on solid ground of the rule of law. No gunboats seeking an alleged payment, no nationalist dictators threatening less powerful economies that they must bend to their will. Instead, international norms, international law, a jurisprudence, a forum. Professor Schachter lived through an earthquake of international law, a catastrophic event and a realignment of the global order after World War II. He spent his life propping up, stitching together, establishing the individual as a subject of international law.
May his memory be a blessing to us all. But now we are faced with the most significant realignment of the global order since 1945. The catastrophic events in Ukraine is a seismic jolt in what has been a slow rumble over the last five years. So what does it mean today as we think about architecture to have a national economy? What does it mean to be a geopolitical economic actor? What does it mean to use your economy as a weapon? And what does this all mean for the future of investment protection? If foreign direct investment, the best hope to accomplish Friedman's thesis that nations that trade with one another don't go to war with one another, what does that mean? And what is the role of non-state actors in this space? Google, Meta, Twitter, Exxon, Citibank. We are all on this shaky ground together, and we must grab a hold of one another if we are meant to regain our balance and establish a new legal consciousness. And I know, George, that I have failed in my mandate because I simply don't know what the future of investment protection means in this current environment. Nor do I know what investment protection should mean in this current environment. Or to put it another way, how one should properly calibrate state obligations given the threats we all face. What I do know is that we only have each other the Invisible College of International Lawyers. And international economic rights are one essential part of that legal consciousness that make up the global world order. And international investment arbitration is the engine for the peaceful settlement of those disputes. So one final quote from Professor Schachter, writing for the future, writing for you and me, writing for us as architects. Professor Schachter made clear, the progress of legal consciousness is ours. And he said in his article, in the final sentence, that, quote, since the governments of the world are likely to be ambivalent about the legal consciousness, the role of the non-official community of lawyers in giving that conception meaning and effect may well constitute the noblest function of the invisible college. So with that, I open it up to additional conversations, and I apologize for not doing what you asked me to do, George. Well, Patrick, you, you had a misconception of what I asked you to do. I, um, I, I would have loved to be able to expect a solution um, from you, but I, I didn't. What I, what I expected was putting everything we've discussed in perspective, uh, and, and that's what you've done. You've put it in a considerably larger perspective than may have been anticipated, but you did exactly uh, what I was hoping you would do. Uh, it's sobering what you have had to say. Uh, we're all sobered these days. Uh, and investor state arbitration is, in comparison with what's at stake in the world, um, it's, it's a small piece. Uh, but that was challenging, and I want to invite my colleagues in the few minutes that remain uh, to respond as you will to what what Patrick had to had to tell us. Maybe I'll jump in just to say that one particularly inspiring of your a particularly inspiring aspect of of your um, your speech, Patrick, to me has been the, the role that you've reminded private actors can play at, on so many levels, whether it's the development of the law of investment arbitration or um, the greater considerations of, of world peace. And we're certainly seeing a lot of that here. So I, I, I do think that, um, and, and this is a, a debate, I'll bring this back to uh, the days when I was co-chairing the uh, arbitration committee of, of the IBA, um, and it's certainly a, a question that that we uh, that we always had with respect to what was then um, an, a raging uh, controversy, which continues to this day with respect to um, the design of the system of investment arbitration. But perhaps with you know fewer of these treaties having been uh, concluded and really sealed. Um, 
And uh, I, I think it is, it is, it is a real, um, it has been a real question for me and many others um, is, as to whether we um, as individuals, as, as corporations and so on are, are, are failing potentially to explain and participate in uh, explaining the, the system better so that we have um, less, um, the problem of perception perhaps is one that, that can be addressed with better communication as is often the case in, in many different settings. Um, and I, I think we all, we can all play, play a role and you certainly, you know, have done that with, with, uh, with your speech, which, which was great. Any closing remarks uh, in light of what Patrick said or otherwise? Are you with us, Clovis? Oh, I was muted. That was quite inspiring and 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 it reminded me that we are architects of peace and, and world order and that that peace and that world order is being threatened and it affects all of us. Thank you. That was quite quite inspiring. Thank you, and uh, and Andrea. No, I agree. It was it was very inspiring and and a good I mean a good reminder of the uh, the fundamental interconnectedness of things, as Douglas Adams would say. But you know, I think it's you gave us the very large picture and the the important and sobering picture. Um, it's I think inspiring to think of Clovis playing a role <laughs> in in this and, and sitting here with us today, notwithstanding what she will be uh, presumably focusing on for the next uh, several days. But I think we do build the world order of peace, um, we hope, of peace and the possibility for peaceful resolution you know, incrementally, one step at a time, one lawyer at a time, one arbitration at a time. So I thank Patrick for putting putting that all together. And I thank all of you for having me as part of Columbia Arbitration Day this year. Andrea, um, Patrick, just a final word uh, from me. Um, on the one hand, we're facing, as you have said, an enormous challenge of so many dimensions and layers and complexity uh, that it's daunting. Um, but it's not my nature to necessarily end on a positive note. Um, but I do want to say that I think the community in which we operate is a, is a community that is as equipped as any is uh, to at least begin to try to address the challenge you've mentioned. Uh, we don't very often compare uh, our potential uh, with the potential of other um, legal communities. But I have, I would say this, I don't think it could be in much better hands. Um, whether we can manage it is an altogether different question. Uh, I don't know if you agree, Patrick, but I have over the years been struck by the resourcefulness uh, and the imagination of the people working in our field of of which you are a spectacular example. Well, obviously I wanna thank my colleagues. This obviously became a very wide ranging, um, a wide ranging exercise. Uh, the challenge is enormous. Uh, what we have to do is keep our eyes on the task that's immediately at hand on Central Working Group 3, and at the same time, the considerations that have surfaced at the end of this program. Uh, we have to um, we have to multitask. Uh, with that, I, I want to thank you all and I want to thank the audience for for your attendance. Uh, and of course, once again, uh, Columbia Arbitration Day and its movements. And I turn things back to them. I expect I am.
Perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much, Professor Berman. Thanks to all the, I mean, we, we started the day with some technical glitches. There was no better way to end the day with some other technical glitches, which, <laughs> which will happen very minor and, and important, especially in light of, of what has just been discussed and of, of Patrick's uh, inspiring speech. Uh, on behalf of, of the Columbia Arbitration Day Organizing Committee, I would like to thank you all for uh, an absolutely wonderful day, four panels, uh, one more interesting than the other. Um, we are very happy that everything worked well, and we hope to see you next year uh, for Columbia Arbitration Day, hopefully in person this time. And um, have a nice evening, have a nice weekend, and see you soon. Thank you.